Welcome to today's event, uh, to, the, to today's cafe. Um, it's nice and intimate. Uh, we are joined today by Nina Felshin, who is a New York-based curator, writer, art historian, and activist. Uh, and she famously edited, it's a while back, but it's still famously edited the book called But Is It Art? The Spirit of Art as Activism. And I'm sure that has um, uh, chased you down for the last uh, 30 years or so, um, <laughs> uh, that very book, uh, which is an anthology that explores activist public art that agitates for social change. Um, Nina, as I said, is an independent curator and uh, was a curator at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, the, also at the Contemporary Art Center in Ohio, as well as the Corcoran Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. And while at Wesleyan, she co-taught a cross-discipline course on issues in contemporary art. She has curated exhibitions with a focus on um, a diverse range of, of topics, including nuclear disarmament, global warming, police violence, and documentary photography around the disasters of war. And today, Nina will talk a bit about the evolution of site-specific practices, conceptualization, and interdisciplinarity, what a word, in the visual arts. And as part of uh, which a growing number of contemporary artists are exploring the history, politics, and culture that is embedded in the actual landscape, both local and global. And with that, uh, you see, we have a latecomer. That is fantastic. So I will first say apologies to Gil if you were stuck in the wrong room, uh, but welcome, the more the merrier, although we are now a baker's dozen. Uh, but with that, I hand over uh, the mic to Nina, oh, which actually then means that I need to present, right, Nina? The floor is yours, Nina. Oh, okay. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on my interest in art and um, politics and activism, um, I grew up in New York City and my parents were, I'm, I'm considered a red diaper baby. I don't know if that term is familiar to any of you, but it usually refers to kids who were born to communists. And my parents would never actually admit to being communist because I think um, part of it was fear, basically, because it was, you know, in the 40s, 50s, and um, McCarthyism was was right there at your door. <laughs> Um, but so, you know, right from the start, I was used to going to demonstrations and thinking somewhat differently than most of my, my friends in school. Um, and, uh, but I, I also developed an interest in art. I mean, I took, you know, arts and crafts lessons and I went to a public high school in New York called the High School of Music and Art. And so I was headed in that direction, really, and, and majored in art history in college and then went to graduate school. And the, the sort of odd thing about the kind of art that was being promoted at that time was in the 60s was what was known as formalism. And again, I don't know, I don't know whether these terms are familiar to all of you, but there was a critic by the name of Clement Greenberg that name ring any bells or um, anyway, he it was really about the work of art. What makes a painting a painting, a flat, a flat canvas, a sculpture is three dimensional. And I thought, what am I doing in this field? Because there was no discussion of content and content was more and more of interest to me. You know, what does the work mean? How does it relate to things outside the frame? Um, and, but then things started to change and, um, in graduate school, I had one professor who, um, introduced me to sort of non-traditional art forms and performance art was one of them. And also, um, the kind of art that might not take place in a art institution might take place outdoors. Um, I lived in Washington for 11 years. That was when I worked at the Corcoran Gallery. Um, I was married to someone who was a reporter for the Washington Post and, you know, during Watergate and all of that. And um, I, um, one of my jobs after the Corcoran Gallery, and basically when I was at the Corcoran, I tried to organize a union and I was fired um, for doing that. And I, <laughs> it was, it was actually 
the beginning of a little bit of a history of being a troublemaker, which was really fun and very and actually very empowering. But my next job, oddly, was at the General Services Administration, which is a federal agency. And I was in a program called Art and Architecture. And every new federal building or old federal building, a certain per percentage of the construction cost or the original construction cost was devoted to commissioning works of art. And so what I, what, and, and at the time, there were, on the other side of that fence, were people who objected to this kind of public art. And they, they was often referred to as the turd in the plaza or plop art, because it, it was formal, abstract. It had no, no relationship to the history of the place. And, um, and then things started to move away. And so that um, outdoor sculpture in very many cases among contemporary artists started to relate to the history of the landscape um, or what took place in a particular locale. And this notion of site specificity became um, of great interest to me um, because I like the idea of a work of art having a, having a context essentially. And oops, what's that? <laughs> um, and um, so, and, and this notion of context has has grown on me over the years, and I, I find that um, I apply it to everything. You know, it sort of becomes part of critical thinking for me. Um, instead of folk zeroing in on an object or a topic, I like to know what surrounds it and what its history is, and that and that sort of thing. Um, it, in um, okay, so in 1999. Um, we could have the first slide. Um, I met Giannis Ziogis, who I think all of you probably know. He was in a program here called the International Studio Program. And at the time, I used to have artists stay with me and pay me a small amount of rent. And uh, we got to be very close friends. And I went to their open studios. And he was he was in a tiny space, really tiny space. But he was making this, he had this sort of maquette for a project that was called Ballads. And it was about a journey. And I, I just fell in love with it. It was just very poetic, very beautiful, um, very in, intimate in a way. And at the time I was at Wesleyan University, and this, this is a space at Wesleyan. It was very dramatic, uh, kind of rugged space that really, weirdly enough, lent itself to site specific works. And so he, um, recreated this work on a very large scale, and it really is about journeys through life. And you know, there's a lot, lot of Greek um, Greek mythology that certainly focuses on that. And so, I don't know um, if anyone's interested in seeing more details of this. I'd be happy to send them to you. Um, and so, the other thing that that interested me at this time, and it, it took somebody else to point it out to me, that a lot of the exhibitions I was doing. Um, kind of, I did one exhibition. The first one I did was called The Presence of Absence. So it was really specific. And I liked the idea of something, um, an object rep evoking some kind of absence, some kind of human presence. And I did a bunch of those shows, not consciously thinking that that's what they were about, but people started pointing that out to me. And um, so I did a show called I did a show called The Presence of Absence. It was one called Empty Dress, em Embedded Metaphor, which was about the use of the bed, the empty bed, and what that, what meaning it might have. Um, and um, I also, um, yeah, so I, and, and so um, I, along with that, I, one form that that took was an exhibition I did called Tainted Landscapes. And um, this was a show I did at Wesleyan, and I became very interested in the notion of a landscape that might look absolutely beautiful, but there's more to it than that, that there's a history embedded in it. And we can look at the, um, the slide, the next slide. Um, and so this was, um, this was part of the show that I did called um, Tainted Landscapes. And Peter Edlund is a painter in New York, and 
this um, he used photographs by Ansel Adams. That was the the starting point. And you know, Ansel Adams um, worked for the Department of Justice in the United States to and and he was assigned to go document in the early 40s or 42, I guess it would have been the Japanese internment camps in the American West. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, this was this was something that um, a wonderful FDR approved of, and the Japanese on the West Coast were interned in these essentially concentration camps, although there was a certain amount of education, and I don't think they were actually tortured, but they've been referred to as concentration camps. So what, what Peter Edlin did was he use these landscapes, and we, we can move on um, to the next one, but you'll see these very garish colors. And uh, the idea was these were right, very close to the sites of the internment camps. And I think that the colors he uses suggests that something's not quite right. But again, it's interesting that Ansel Adams was doing these, you know, very kind of dramatic, um, photographs at the same time that he was out there um, photographing the internment camps for the for the US government. Um, I think there's one more in this category. And for me, the uh, colors he uses are, this is, these are a little bit faded in, on the screen, but I think they suggest that something is amiss, you know, that this is not quite natural. Um, so there was another artist in that show um, Sando Burke, um, Babak, I think we're ready for the next one. And he did two series, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast, and they were both called Prison Nation. And on the West Coast, um, he used or sort of adapted the kind of painting that was done by these romantic landscape painters like um, Bierstadt, and I should know the other names, but I'm not remembering. Um, and um, and painted these beautiful landscapes. And then, I don't know if you can see, but in the very far distance, this is San Quentin State Prison, way in the back, you can see these sprawling prisons that inhabit these landscapes. Um, we have another one, I think. Um, let's see what's next. And um, here's another one. This is um, a con correctional facility that you can also see way in the background. So he's taking the this sort of this notion of the sublime American landscape and and suggesting that there's more to it than the landscape itself. And um, this, you know, I found this very interesting. And um, and the show I think was in I forget exactly when it was, but um, not long after that. Um, I, um, Yanni actually invited me to Prespa to go on the march in, I think it was 2011. And I, then, you know, I was in the, a real landscape and I could see his students had done projects and I was there, I was, I was, it was really more like a vacation than work, but um, I was, I was brought over there as a critic um, to sort of look at the students' projects and comment on them. And that was when I really got interested in the actual landscape and what, um, you know, what it means and what is not seen. And another, in other words, I, this is another um, example of the presence of absence. Um, when these students made projects in the landscape that, that gave you some sense of um, what took place there. And in, in Greece, in the, in the north of Greece, a lot of it had to do with, well, there was, of course, there was the, um, the, the uh, communists and the guerrillas for, being forced to leave Greece during um, the Civil War, but there were also, um, after the fall, I think it was after the fall of the Soviet Union, there were immigrants coming into Greece, and often there were remnants of that movement that were left behind, and the students did, you know, performative stuff, and um, anyway, I got very, very interested in that, and then I started to explore um, artists, other artists, or I didn't necessarily consciously explore, but they came, they came um, into my consciousness through, you know, through seeing the work. And I realized that there were quite a few artists who were um, 
using walking, and I should have said with, you know, of course, the March to Prespa was all about walking. Um, so, um, I also developed an interest, and I'll, I'll sort of come back to this, but in um, 2008, when there was um, an intifada in Israel-Palestine, and um, I was a co-founder of a group called Jews Say No. I'm, I'm Jewish, but I'm not observant. And I, um, and actually my grandmother was born in Palestine. Um, she, her parents obviously came from someplace else. So, and I had um, an uncle who was a poet and he, st my sister still has the, the books. Um, his poetry was about growing up and basically getting along with all the Arab families around them and um, playing with the kids, the, the Jews even who were there, who had come there from parts of Europe, and many from the Ukraine, actually, interestingly enough, um, were um, even wore the garb, the traditional Arab garb, for a certain amount of time. So, um, let's see. Um, so, an, a, a work, I guess I'll, co I'll come to that, but a work that, um, that actually relates to the landscape of Palestine is um, work by Francis Alice, um, I think we have maybe have a photograph or we have the yeah okay so um, have any of you are any of you aware of his work I'm just curious um, he is originally from Belgium but I think he makes his home in Mexico City now and a lot of his projects have to do with walking and this um, particular project um, there's a video which I'm not going to show now we have a we have a very short video, but you know, if you're interested, I would I would recommend looking at the the whole video. Um, here you have him starting out. Um, he walks the the uh, the original green line, which was made in which was established in 1947 48, and you see the map. And this um, this was established after the well the. Israelis call it the War of Independence, and the Palestinians call it the Nakba. And um, it was a line that was established that divided um, t the territory. Um, and it, what's interesting about it? Well, we'll take a look at the um, we'll take a look at the short video because it gives a little bit of an explanation. But I think one thing that's very interesting, you know, when you look at this picture, um, again, this is you know this issue of context. One it's easy to not think that someone, that no one is photographing him. So he has to have some sort of crew there, you know, so he's not totally on his own. And also there's a, um, an Israeli soldier who's not bothering him. And you can just imagine if it was a Palestinian with a can of paint walking along, um, probably wouldn't last very long. And so he's just, you know, the, what I love about his work, um, Elisa's work is that, there's there's a kind of humor in it that underscores the absurdity of this this particular line because it, on a map it looks like just a line but in fact in real life it's so wide that it's completely meaningless um, one thing i'd like to say about my own work is that while i'm interested in art that you know has some social or political content i also believe very strongly in in poetry, and so I'm not so interested in work that's very didactic, but this kind of work that is, you know, it's not, te it's, it, in, in a certain way, it's neutral. It's, it, I mean, that's, that was the artist's intent, um, even though, I guess, depending upon where one comes from, it might not read as neutral. So the red line was drawn drawn by the Jordanian um, person in command. What you will see if you look at the long version is um, is um, Francis Elise going through neighborhoods, you know, Orthodox Jewish neighborhoods, Palestinian neighborhoods, and so it just it sort of gives you a sense of how. Um, problematic a line like that is that it cuts people off from each other and um, and that sort of thing. I, I I recommend looking at it. And he does um, if you go to his website and you look up this particular piece, 
he does conversations about it with lots of different um, Israeli and Palestinian journalists, and I think some, maybe some officials. And so you might get different points of view from different people. And I think that's a, an interesting part of the project, actually. Um, you know, I just, if you don't mind, Babak, um, can you say a few words just because it relates in a way <laughs> to your little walk in New York? Yeah, sure. Um, so I walked uh, another line uh, last week. I was uh, visiting New York. Um, and um, one thing I learned of um, maybe a decade or so ago is that there is a wire spun around most of the perimeter or almost the complete perimeter of Manhattan. Uh, not quite, but well, it's spun in a circle, but it doesn't quite follow the full perimeter of the island. Um, and it's called an Eruf, if my pronunciation is correct. And it's a bit of a um, trick uh, used by a particular flavor of um, those of the Jewish faith, which allows them to, on the Sabbath, Sabbath see the space that is enclosed by the wire uh, as essentially within their own home. And that allows them to do things like push a stroller for kids and say, uh, carry a walking cane for walking. So it's uh, really designed to make their lives a little bit easier. Um, because if you're very strict observant, then you are not allowed to do anything that would be uh, considered work uh, on the Sabbath. Um, so I walked that line, um, which uh, was enacted in Manhattan in 1999. Um, and if you look at the website, should be up um, and is supposedly monitored once a week to see whether it's up. Um, but I'm fairly confident that it's not up. Uh, I saw it broken in many places. But uh, the route turned out to be almost 50 kilometers long. So it's a wire that was about 50 kilometers. And uh, I walked that uh, last uh, Tuesday trying to follow um, the route. Uh, and I followed the route, but the wire was not always there. And the, the wire is high up. So um, it's not like you can, you sort of have to know what you're looking for. And I think it also allows um, people, observant Jews, to shop on Saturday. And I think ordinarily that would not be permitted. So there's an, another line, and um, which I found very very interesting. I was aware of it in my neighborhood, in, in, at near, not right in my neighborhood. I had, I had never heard of it before. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, so um, in 2005, as you might remember, there was the Hurricane Katrina. And um, a number of artists, I mean, and also a, a lot of artists became interested in climate change and a lot of work reflected that. I did a show at Wesleyan called Disaster One Year After um, that took place in 2006. And um, Francis Cape um, was in the show. And this is, this is actually the installation in the, in, at Wesleyan University. And what you see, well, we have some details, but these photographs, he walked for, I think, two and a half hours in a part of New Orleans, not the, um, not the ninth, um, what was that called? The ninth ward, which was, got the brunt of the damage and it was a very poor neighborhood. But this is, this was, he walked in, um, you know, sort of a middle class neighborhood and, um, just photographed houses. And you, what you see is, um, the water line where the water came up to. And this, he happens to be, a, he was early on a carpenter and a architect. He was trained as an architect. And so this installation um, is intended to suggest the wainscoting, the, the wood on the lower part is, is meant to suggest a line as well. Um, so let's take a look at the next one. We see a few details and you can see that line that goes across the front of the house where the, how, that's how far the water came up. Um, there's another one where you see it, I think, on the garage. Um, and so that's another project that involved walking and photography. Um, and um, I also did a, an exhibition um, a little bit later uh, called um, Global Warning with an N artists in climate change. And um, there was an artist, there is an artist by name Eve Mosher. And she did a project, I mean, oddly, it sounds a little bit similar, High Water Line. This is in 2007. 
And what this project is, is she, with geological survey maps, she um, was able to determine um, if there were a very devastating flood in New York, where the how far the water would come. And um, she, this is blue, light blue chalk, um, and she walked 70 miles um, in Brooklyn and Manhattan, tracing this line. And we have a short, um, I'm going to do a short part of the video <coughs> that will give you a better idea of what this was about. So I just I just want to say that um, one thing to keep you know to be aware of and and this is more or less stated in this work is that when um, one of the things I like about these kinds of projects is that it does engage a community and um, what's also significant is that it it also uh, attracts media attention and then the message gets much uh, gets a much more expanded audience. Um, and that's, I think, what happened with, with that project and very much so with this project coming up. Dred Scott is an artist um, who has been working for a long time. And um, this is an amazing project. I think it took three years to complete. And he worked with um, co the community, uh, eight communities, I should say, in New Orleans to prepare this. Um, in 1811, there was a slave revolt in uh, the area of New Orleans, um, and I think it started in, um, I forget the name of the town, and ended up around New Orleans, but this general area. And <clears throat> he, um, and though he, in, he involved dressmakers and um, costume designers and musicians and, and just people who lived there. Um, and it was an incredible way for um, the people in the community to learn about this history. This, by the way, this slave revolt, which was, a, you know, and ended up being a failure, came not very long after the revolution in Haiti, which is probably the only slave revolt that have ever succeeded. Of course, Haiti's been paying for it ever since. But um, anyway, um, I thought this is a... I think this is a wonderful little video, and um, the other thing I might point out, although, you know what, I'll let Dredd do the rest of the talking on this. <laughs> So um, I think, I mean, I was going to talk a little bit more about um, my interest in the landscape of, of the occupied territories, Israel, Palestine, um, but I, we may, may not have enough time. And I did, there are a couple of links that you guys can look at um, on, online um, that would give you, give you some ideas about, you know, what it is I've been involved with. Um, and I'd love to love to open it up and hear from others and questions, whatever. Thank you very much, Nina. This was great. Um, and I would love to hear more, uh, indeed, on uh, the Palestinian territories uh, as well. Uh, but indeed, maybe if there are a few questions from those that are here, um, please jump in and then maybe we can go back to uh, Nina's narrative in a minute. Um, I have one um, general question to mm -hmm. uh, kick it off. Oh, and if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand physically. You can raise your hand uh, using the app. Bob has a question. I see you. Um, or uh, you can just jump in if you feel that one of us talks too much. <laughs> now, the, the question <laughs> that I have is um, uh, you, um, uh, as I said, famously um, uh, 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 edited But Is It Art in uh, the early 90s, that was. Um, and specifically there, you uh, investigate the border between uh, art and activism. And if I'm not mistaken, the majority of activism that, is, or a lot of the activism that is highlighted, really uh, happens in the physical space. It's not uh, visual arts. 
Um, mm. But you started your presentation with a few examples of visual art, which also make uh, a statement. And you shifted towards, uh, well, for the purpose of uh, this fine community, uh, presumably, to art that also occurs in the physical space, but um, is centered on walking. But my question is, have you seen uh, in this, this area where art meets activism, trends over the last 30 years has anything changed or you know what has what has changed um let's see how can i say all this well for one thing in terms of myself um this is this is not that this phenomenon has changed but i've come to um look at the practices that are featured in my book um, because what's amazing about them, th this is the book was published in 1995, is that the, the issues that are dealt with are as timely today as they were then. Um, sexual harassment, um, uh, poverty, racism, um, you name it. And what I've, and as I said earlier, when I talked about how important context is for me, um, the way I've come to look at things is much more systemically that um, while these practices are very important, and I think it, I think uh, I don't think that they necessarily um, they may change something locally, but I don't necessarily think that um, activist art changes it. What it does is it changes the way we think about. It can has the potential for changing the way we think about things. And I think that's a be that's definitely a beginning of changing things. Um, so I think um, it it can raise consciousness in a way that is more accessible sometimes. And in in you know as I said earlier, um, if it's poetic, I think it becomes even more accessible to a broader audience. So it's bringing issues to the attention of um, of others. I think what has happened, and this is always a problem with this kind of art, is that the danger is that it can be co-opted by the art world or even by corporations. You know, they might fund something. And I think there, uh, one has to be careful about the strings that can become attached. And um, this has happened with political movements too. I mean, it's not just it's not just art. Um, so that what can happen is um, certain the objects that might be attached to some of these um, some of these um, practices can end up in a museum. And the way I and that did not happen previously. Um, the way I look at it is that. Um, that is not the art. That is not what is intended at all. Because um, the participation, the um, the usually it, it can often be in a public space. It, it doesn't take place in a museum originally, but it can be. I think if it's shown as documentary evidence of a project, that's okay. But if it's commodified in a way that it's for sale. That is very troubling to me, and um, I think a lot of things have become commodified. You know, it's also I think it's fabulous that you know there's much more diversity in art museums and commercial art galleries, but in a certain way that can that can be a, a form of co-optation also, and um, a form of you know almost a form of exploitation. And I think artists should be able to make a living. There's no question about it, but I don't think they should be used. <laughs> And so um, I think there's more activist art, um, but maybe less collectives than there were at, uh, you know, say 20, 25 years ago. So it's individuals doing things. And um, yeah, so I would say that's a very good question, actually. Um, of the people I mentioned, um, people I, I talked about, um, well, Dredd has always has always been, you know, he's been doing this kind of work for his whole career. Eve, I mean, an interesting thing about Eve Mosher is that her, her that project she did in New York City became, in a sense, became national because climate change doesn't just it's not a threat to New York City; it's a threat in many parts of the world and certainly in the United States. And so she worked with local communities, um, and and so that kind of thing can be really great. Um, yeah, so I think I think it still exists. Um, I think the art world is generally pretty conservative politically, and um, yeah. So I'm not sure if that 
helps at all. Um, but keep asking questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's okay. interesting, Andrew. I, oh, I, I, indeed. So, Moshe, the, the high, high water line also took place in London, apparently. I did not know. Yeah. Um, but your point, I think, is very um, uh, on point. Uh, I was talking to someone else today as well about how, um, uh, um, well, culture, it was about culture, but it also applies to art, uh, particularly, I suppose, when it's activist art. There is this risk of commodification and commercialization. Yeah. Because both of these sides are pulling at this thing. Uh, but both of these directions take away from the objective of uh, uh, the work, right? Because it's about building awareness. And if it's commercialized, then it becomes a product. And if it's commodified, yeah. then it becomes trivial. Yeah. Um, uh, Simon, you also <clears throat> had a, a practical question where you use two a name and a word that I do not recognize. So I'll let you ask the question if you are interested. Oh. Did I, or was it an observation? Um, <laughs> I, I can't wait to get the book. It's, it's super relevant. I was, I was. Thank you so much for the presentation. This is so up my street, and it's so insanely relevant right now. Um, so this is, this is really great stuff. And I was nodding away. Um, some people think that Pussy Riot is actually funded by the Kremlin, but then they, they would say that. The Kremlin would say that. A friend doesn't like the KLF because he says that pranksters' individualism doesn't change things, movements change things. And, and the situation is, of course, worried about recuperation. And when you see people wearing the Che Guevara T-shirts or the Bader Meinhof T-shirts and yeah. they don't even know who the person is, there's, there's, there's definitely something in there with that um, the spectacle. But what I want to specifically ask you about was, um, what about the tension between aesthetics and and the issue? So say, for example, right, you, you, you've got this weird, um, but then the the art that's made isn't 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 very good, you know. So say for example, I mean, I sometimes I see a, 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 a type art project, and the the photographs are really aesthetically um, striking, and I sometimes find it, it's like, oh, is it is it is this art or is this activism, and does it matter? And and could you have a really important issue, but with like weak art? Or, 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 or could you have really great art that actually is not really about a very important issue? Does, does that make sense, the tension? Uh, yes, I think that's a, a really good question. It, and it, there's a lot to talk about, really. Um, I think um, if I can just step back for one second, I think one of the things that, that I've come to, my own thinking about this has evolved, which, and it is that I, I think um, a creative process, which in a sense could be seen as an aesthetic process, um, it takes different forms. And I think um, that, for example, I'll give you an example of something that I think is just a brilliant project, but there, it wasn't aesthetic in terms of a beautiful art object. Um, there was a, a young guy who ended up going to Harvard Divinity School in um, He's in California. I think he was actually in in graduate school there uh, in art, you know, an undergraduate or a graduate art program. And he heard that there was going to be a auction of public land in the west of the United States, which meant that um, anyone could buy it and privatize it and, you know, drill for oil or any number of things. So he went to the auction um, and this would be devastating for the environment. He went to the auction and um, he was asked why he was there, and he suddenly he he didn't he was going to observe, but he decided he was going to participate in the auction. He didn't have money, but he bought something like I forget how many four hundred square miles of land, and um, it was just to me that was a very and and okay. So what happened was it got a lot of attention. He actually went to jail, prison for two years, and. Um, he, but it got a huge amount of me, and this was not his intention to get media attention. It wasn't his intention to go to prison, but Obama heard about it, and he actually canceled the sale of the land. So there you have something that actually had a result, um, and I thought it was just, you know, there's something, I mean, apart from, <laughs> apart from, I mean, there's a major thing that he, he, you know, had to go to prison for two years, but there was something almost playful about the idea to do that, when um, 
you know, the people who were actually, um, he, he wanted to protect the land is what it came down to. So to me, um, that, that kind of creativity, I don't distinguish, I guess, between that kind of creativity and what we would think of as more traditionally aesthetic. I think about creativity as a broad, as a broad, more encompassing um, subject. Um, so I, I'm probably not answering your question at all, but um, <laughs> um, I, do, I do think, I also think that the playfulness in a sense becomes um, a kind of, um, a kind of poetry. I mean, he's taking this very serious event and doing something um, sort of turning it on its head in a way, uh, doing something unexpected. Um, and, and I, you know, I think he probably intended to get um, media attention, but I'm not sure he expected to go to prison for it. And so there have been a lot of projects like that, that I've come to respect as much as those projects that are by art people who represent themselves as, as artists. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. And please ask me more if I'm not answering quite the way you want me to. No, that's that, that's totally. And there's a great follow-on question in the chat. But um, yeah, that was great. Thank you. Okay. Simon, you also had a very specific question about uh, Jeremy Deller and Org Grieve. No. Oh, it was just an observation that that um, Jeremy Deller recreated the Battle of Org Grieve, and I, I thought of that. When I saw the that really good film about about uh, the reenactment, um, yeah. Dred Scott, right? I get it. I, I don't know that work by Diller. Sorry. Yeah, but by the way, I should go back to the Dred Scott thing because you know he got funding from among others, and he got it, this took a lot of money to do, um, but he got funding from the Ford Foundation, which is is a um, you know everyone thinks it's a great foundation, but it has some kind of sleazy connections to the U.S. government. And, um, you know, so, you know, you could criticize that. Um, but I don't think he's someone who could be co-opted. I mean, he's very radical politically and he, he really stands his ground. Uh, but he's managed to, um, he's managed to navigate the art world without being pulled in. Um, so that's very unusual, I think. Um, Plus his his project it was oh I'm sorry I was just going to say his no, no. project was so um, you know so professionally done I mean you know the costumes were gorgeous and you know nothing nothing was spared really to make this thing happen and make it happen the way it was and people criticized the fact that there was all this media around he was having it photographed well my answer to that is that's how you spread. The message, you know, you spread the word and people become aware of these issues and the, the attempt at a, a slave rebellion. And so it can start a dialogue. And I think I think kind of, com you know, those kinds of conversations are really important. Um, Video reminded me a little bit of looking at uh, uh, the making of of uh, a major blockbuster film. Uh, yeah. Where well, you, you see behind the scenes, but the, uh, right. the enactment looks real. Yeah, actually, there's a um, there is a filmmaker, very famous. Um, gosh, I I can never say his name. He's I think he's Nigerian by birth, but lives in the UK. Ekroma, or um, who's done some really amazing films, and he is working on a film. I don't think his films are shown in theaters. I think they're shown in museums and uh, that kind of thing. But um, so this was a major undertaking. Um, anyway. Bob, you also had a question. Uh, you're on mute. Oh, yeah, I got it. Hi, Nina. Now, Hi. I was I was I was one of the first performance artists in mm -hmm. England in in the sixties, and at that time it didn't have a label. You, I was just doing it. I didn't know anybody. Well, I haven't really known anybody for the whole of my life, actually, but uh, of in that area. But now. That same feeling I had then about performance art was through Babak and that I've been familiarized with what's called walking art. And that, do you know what? I've got the same feeling about walking art 50 years on that I had about performance art 50 years ago. Yeah. And I'm feeling that walking art is what performance art is morphing into. I just wondered if you have an opinion about that. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, that you bring that up because I think, um, you know, it's, it's funny, and this is kind of comes out of the academic world. I think that there is there is this term that's used very frequently that something is performative. You know, meaning I think that um, I don't. I think there's a slight difference between performance art and performative, but they're related. It's, and it's very much so. Yes. Yeah. So I do think there's a connection. Um, I wouldn't. I don't know. I mean, I guess you could expand the meaning of performance art. I don't see walking quite as performance art per se. Um, I, can, I, can, I can explain if you like a little bit. Maybe. The idea sure. of if, if performance art, it, traditional art is the fingertips with a paintbrush. Performance mm -hmm. art is from the head to the fingertips. A walking art is moving that studio. So it's it's like it's being moved. It's physically this thing from the head to the fingertips is actually moving. This is a transition. Mm -hmm. So it, with, 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 with narrative art in the 19th century, performance art in the early 20th, late late 20th, early 21st. And now with walking art, I feel it as taking it um, like a mobile art studio almost, a, a mobile consciousness mover. Yeah, I, I do think, that, I definitely think they're related. Um, and I mean, people do so, people who engage, and Jez is a good example in the way he would talk about what he does and how he sees walking in relation to himself. People have different concepts about it, which I think is great. You know, um, there's not just one, it's not like using a medium like paint. It's not like being a painter. It's so many, it has so many dimensions or potentially has so many dimensions. Simon, you have a follow up question on this uh, dichotomy between commercialization and commoditiz commoditization, commoditization. My English is commodification. Simon, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> um, I just wondered if it's inevitable that we'll see uh, people like the far right doing the things that are traditionally associated with the left because they're already rebranding themselves. So is it inevitable that we will see fascist street art, fascist flash mobs, uh, and and um, art festivals and things like that? As they, we're already seeing the stickers. The stickers are already going up. So is it inevitable that all these techniques that traditionally we associate with like the cool kids and, and the left being appropriated by the right? Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm wondering whether I'd call it appropriation. I think, um, you know, we had uh, for many years art, um, look at going back to Skokie, Illinois, Back in, I don't remember what decade that was, the 70s maybe, when there was a um, Nazi march in Skokie. I doubt very much that they thought of that as performance, yet I think that we see things, we may actually perceive things through our eyes as performative or performance. But yes, I think they're going to do whatever they can to get attention, and being out on the street is um, and doing something that's I, you know, that's going to bring them attention. Um, so I'm not. I don't know. I mean, what do others think about this notion of appropriation? I, I'm not sure. I would. Um, I'm not sure that. I don't know. I just don't know. Um, I think there's certainly um, a parallel. Uh, and I should yeah. say also that not all activist art is necessarily. It could be with a community where. It's not visible to everybody. It's working closely, yeah, working closely with a particular community. I want to comment on um, the, the nature of appropriation by maybe uh, the right. If not, jump in when you feel like it, because I do have uh, a few words on this, not so much about a... activism, perhaps. Oh. Sorry, the, um, I was just thinking about the points raised by um, Simon and about the far right uh, taking on a cultural strategy. Well, there is an excellent example, isn't there, from 40s Germany uh, with the Nazis and how they created their own imagery based on this ideal of uh, the German wonder being, 
you know, the, the, the master race, which is awful, but also um, ancient Rome in terms of the architecture. So there are there is a history of it. But the other impulse is to destroy anything that kinds of challenges or disrupts the narrative of a, a of a right thinking thing. So it works on two levels. It's kind of like um, an aggrandizement of their own stuff and a diminution of the other thing, which is what all the, the woke, um, you know, the culture wars is all based on this idea of dividing society rather than uniting it. And I think the impetus between the impetus for, say, somebody who's left leaning is to, to develop a collaborative, build a social society that's interrelated and interdependent, whereas with the right, it's more about um, partitioning and separating to to get um, ideas that maybe aren't in the interests of the people to be, you know, on the agenda. That's my thought anyway. I have a, I, oh, can I respond or? Yeah. Un unfortunately, you know, I hate to say this, but this is definitely a problem on the left as well. And um, I see it as, a kind of weaponization of identity politics. Um, I think identity politics is really an important phenomenon and people should be very proud of who they are and what their roots and all of that. But what's happened, at least in this country, is that there's this tension where, you know, if, I'll give you an example. I mean, this is crazy, but um, I, um, I proposed to an art magazine that considers itself radical, playful, blah, 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 um, to launch um, the web version of an artist's work that had existed as an installation. And it was called Disturbances. And it was about, it was, it used only existing footage from the Rodney King verdict. You know, Rodney King was the um, truck driver who was, you know, kind of beaten up by the police and California, this goes back to 1991 or something like that. And um, the guy, and I, oh, so it was the anniversary of the the verdict um, a few years back. And um, I suggested this, that they launch this web version on the anniversary. And the um, editor of the magazine said, oh, I love this idea. It's a great idea. Then the next day I get an email saying, the artist is white. We can't do it. And this is the kind of insanity that occurs every day here. You know, you cannot even be compassionate. And it, what's what what's amazing to me about it is it's it's you know it's perfect for <laughs> I hate to sound this way, but it's it's kind of ideal for the U.S. government because it keeps people at each other's throats rather than uniting them. And it would, to, you know, if people came together in solidarity, there'd be much greater strength and the possibility for real change. Um, so anyway, That's, so I'm just saying this is on the left too. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think it's across the board and I think it's systematic of like how um, the the politicians like to play the game. Yep, They absolutely. like to polarize. Uh, and if they can get it more extreme, then the algorithms love it. And also all of a sudden, you know, ideas that are fed in from think tanks and from real extremist perspectives are kind of finding their way into the mainstream and like becoming consensus thinking because the algorithms are see because of clickbait, basically, right. and how journalism yeah. works. Um, it's, it's a really intriguing and horrible conundrum. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really about making connections on a human level. Yeah. And, and just being true to yourself and not kind of being taken up by whatever's presented to you as something that needs to be in your thinking. You know, you need to mm -hmm. kind of have perspective on it all. I think that's a bit of a red herring, if you don't mind me saying so. I'll tell you why, is I think um, uh, if the far right uh, 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 appropriated it, they couldn't because they wouldn't know what to do with it. Then please, please go on because I'm really intrigued because I, I kind of I'm smiling because I kind of kind of know the truth of what you're saying in a way. Well, appropriated what? It, I mean, it's, I'm not counter, sure. it's counter. It's counter thinking to right wing people to pick up um, performance art for a start or even uh, walking art. I mean, it's beyond their consciousness. So they could do an imitation of it, but it wouldn't be grounded 
because they're they're you know they're, it's crap basically. And, you know, it'd be transparent to anybody who knows. People who don't know could be fooled by it, which is the art market and money and all of that. But basically, Collingwood, going back to Collingwood, the role of the artist is to work to prevent the corruption of consciousness. If that's, we know on the level of consciousness that it's crap, and that's all that matters. It's not about money. If people make it about money, then they can have a change on it. But if it's about something spiritual or something of more significance, then it's immediately apparent that they don't know what the fuck they're doing, basically. There you go. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's, it's intriguing. I was talking more generally, I think, uh, than specifically about um, the art. I was thinking about how art in, and ideas influence thinking on a societal level. But I think you can smell a you can smell a rat <laughs> or something um, that's uh, not quite genuine. Um, I believe that it's easy. totally possible to, to smell a rat by people who are, say, somewhat educated or more experienced uh, in relation to the material or the methods, just like uh, most journalists will be able to identify fake news easier easy. than the general public will be. Um, so if it, but if it comes down to um, what your audience is, who you are trying to influence, then it might be very effective, um, because uh, you know, we, of course, we are very, us here, us thirteen or whatever it is in this room, we are of course very knowledgeable and very intelligent, and we will be able to sp spot a fake uh, performer the moment he steps out of his house. But the general public will have a harder time and if the objective is to influence the general public or maybe to confuse the general public to have to choose between a more genuine activist artist and one who tries to confuse the world um, that might not be obvious at all to uh, to the one on the receiving to those on the receiving end uh, so yeah they might not know what they do and it might be obvious to some but it will not necessarily be obvious to everyone yeah, but they don't need to know. The, the role of the artist is to put it out, and the role of the per, the person is to be mystified, and that's the state in its own state. It's a statement. That, that, that makes sense as far as art, for, more for art's sake is concerned, I would say. But if it's art as activism, then I'm I'm not so sure. What's well, activism? As as an artist, you you have a project and an intention, and then if you work in like a social sphere, say as a, and a socially engaged or an activist artist, you have an agenda, which is to get people involved with the project and find out what they're thinking about the ideas that you're dealing with and find ways of getting them to be, in, you know, to, to engage with it. That weasel word that's used by all the arts organisations, but that's what it's about. It's like, how does what I put out there interact with the world what's what happens what can be created what's the space what's the shared space what can we co-create rather than creating something here's my statement about the world look at it um isn't it great it's a different process i think well I, again let me just say something I'm a, as a performance artist, I support the Russian invasion of U the Ukraine. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a statement. Now, that will have all sorts of ramifications and reactions to people. And that's an example of activist art, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you might not agree with what I'm saying, but I, I feel I'm you know, towing the party line here, and I don't see anyone else. It doesn't matter, but you know, I've just said something real. I'm going to ask Viv to uh, throw in a question. <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't relate directly to uh, what Robert was saying, but um, you know, one of the things I really like about what Nina is saying is the the sort of poetic aspect of activist art, and that's always why I've liked Francis Alice and people like that. You know, and that sort of almost playfulness, but there's like an irony in it, and there's a it's not it directly stating exactly what it thinks, and um, I find that very appealing. And I, I, just thinking of appropriation, I think a good example really is um, not particularly the right wing, but the consumerist society, how, you know, Barbara Kruger, for example, you know, I shop, therefore I am. I mean, 
what a wonderful kind of <laughs> ironic thing that was when it first came out and and now seeing that all over selfridges you know being used in a totally unironic way assumedly because that's what they want to sell you the t-shirt and the bag that says that um you know, and how I guess that I'm not sure quite where I'm going with this, really. But there's something about when irony and when that um, critical thinking is taken out yeah, of the equation, <laughs> then it goes yeah. somewhere very worrying. Yeah, I, I, that's an interesting point, because um, in the introduction to my book, I actually bring up Barbara Kruger and Jenny Holzer as examples of, you know, that's not I don't consider their work activist art. Mm -hmm but that it, it is easily co-opted. And that's exactly what you're describing in self, with Selfridges using it as, um, you know, cause you can, there's a certain uncertainty about what it means or what her position is in a certain way. Um, and um, I, I guess I think with, I mean, I, I definitely agree that with um, someone like Francis Solis, you know, the fact that he doesn't state his position um, but allows, uh, I mean, what's interesting about the long video, just to back up a little bit, is that it's it's shocking how few people actually notice what he's doing, you know, that, that even look at him, which means, I mean, I am just like terminally curious and I would stop and ask him, what the fuck is he doing? Um, I mean, I would see a green line, maybe I'd have some idea myself, but it's striking how people don't even see him, you know? Um, but for me, um, it's such an opportunity to project on what he's doing, possibly what you already think, or maybe raise questions about it. And I think, um, you know, I, I, I guess I don't know what, where I'm going with that. But anyway, I, I, um, I do, I do think, I mean, the Yes Men is another example. And um, there's a show of theirs that's up in New York City right now, where sometimes you, um, you know, it's it's a little bit about like winking at the notion of fake news, um, where um, where you don't you don't necessarily you're not really sure what's going on, and um, you know you. But anyway, um, just a thought. <laughs> and yet, interestingly, people were asking Eve Mosha, weren't they? I wonder if it's yeah. a different way of presenting. Well, she was, and thing. she was, yeah, and she was really having dialogues with people. Mm. I mean, that was what was, I think, one of the brilliant aspects of that work is, yes, absolutely. You know, what a difference. Um, but, you know, people, I, I don't know whether people are just uh, more used to that kind of engagement in a place like New York City or um, who knows? I don't really know. But I think that happened wherever she did that work. Uh, Jess. Yeah, just, just to pick up and support what Nina was saying about uh, uh, Francis Alice's work, there's a, a lovely moment in that film, in the long version, where he actually engages, or children engage with him quite yeah. a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. really, really interesting, and it's sort of key, but not key, where they're, you know, the future is looking at this guy who's talking about the past. That's how I read it. Yeah. And everybody else is trying to guard the past. Yeah. So regard the past. And the right. children are going, well, this, this is a bit of a crazy guy doing this. And I love <laughs> that bit of the film. And they're That's also, would... you know, kids yeah. tend to be sort of more innocent. And I mean, mm. there's a lot of surveillance that goes on in that part of the yeah. world. And, you know, sort of checking and questioning and arresting mm. and all sorts of stuff. So I, I, I suspect, I mean, I'm not saying this is the reason, but kids are, you know, they're exempt from that. Um, yeah. If only they could stay that way. <laughs> That's why I like dogs and kids, little kids <laughs> <laughs> and cats. <laughs> ah, ah, that, that was the, the crucial word for me to hear that you also cats? like cats. Oh, oh my, I have two of them. Oh, yeah. They're, they're both snoozing ah, right good. now. <laughs> Mm, so we will have to believe. Uh, Simon, okay. you had another question. Yeah, Nina, I'd, I'd love to hear your thought. I think I know what you're going to say actually now. You kind Tell of... me what I'm going to say. Well, no, you partially addressed it. But it's... 
it's the tension between, okay, I'm an activist, I, I've got to get everything across, and I've got to make sure people fully understand all the important in intricacies of this story, and I'm an artist, I need to leave space for people to create, um, otherwise I'm just, I might as well just lecture people. What do, you, what do you think about the tension between show and tell? That's, that's a great question, because um, I find that, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm going to digress for one second here. Um, I tend to be, I think, more radical or left than many of my friends. And in this particular atmosphere that we've had for <laughs> some time, not, not just what's going on right now, I get very bizarre responses to um, me either sending them an article from, let's say, independent media, or they don't want to hear. They just don't want to know, you know, what's going on from a different point of view. So it's hard to... Um, it's it's very hard to know how to handle that stuff. Um, I I you know sometimes I find myself when I'm t I'm talking to someone about something and I, and I'll say I'll suddenly say don't get me started because I'm just concerned that <laughs> they're going to back off or whatever. Um, but I I don't think art has to. Ta I, I guess that's where I said I think I said earlier on I'm not um, work that's dogmatic. I think there's a place, you know, for posters and graffiti and all of that. It's not that I don't like that kind of work, but for me to really be art, I think content and poetry needs to be fused. And I would say that that means not spelling everything out, you know? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think for me, maybe that's more journalism. Um, I, I think uh, I, I like the idea of people um, being able to project some of their own baggage on a particular work of art, and and that to me would be the poetry. So I don't think it's I don't think it's a job of artists to necessarily change someone's mind, but I think to raise one's consciousness or make someone aware of you know another way to look at something, or even to um, kind of inform them that a particular phenomenon exists in society that they may not know about. Um, you know, so I, I, I remember when I did this show about police violence at Wesleyan, um, there were parents, it was on over parents weekend and I had parents coming up who were, you know, there were, you know, a fair number of black students at Wesleyan, parents coming up in tears in their eyes because they didn't know about particular incidents that had occurred and, um, and, uh, yeah, so, and I think, you know, it's interesting also that the administration totally freaked out when the opening was going to take place on a parent's weekend and they wanted to change the date of the opening. And then they wanted to run every single work by the police department, the local police department in Middletown, Connecticut. And so you see, they felt that the work was very dangerous in some way, um, dangerous to, you know, maybe in terms of the police department or the trustees of the institution that police protect in a sense. Um, but so it, it sort of depends on your point of view, how you see, how you see things, you know. Um, so, um, yeah, I do. I do feel like an element of poetry is important, and also when when I do, I do. A, you know, I've done. I mean, I'm more or less retired, but I did a lot, done a lot of group shows, and and one thing that interests me about a group exhibition is that you can put work in an exhibition, a group exhibition that ordinarily you might not think belongs in that exhibition, but it might resonate with other work in the exhibition to bring out something about it that you might not necessarily have thought about before. Um, so, and that to me is poetry also, this kind of resonation of different kinds of works of art. And it gets you to think. I mean, I like the idea of people using their heads, you know, when they're looking at art. Um, anyway, I probably didn't answer that question either. <laughs> no, that was great, thank you, that was great. <laughs> And Nina, earlier on you said that you uh, would have wanted to also highlight a little bit more of work uh, in and on Palestine. 
Mm -hmm. We've had a bit of a discussion now that touched on that, but uh, if you want, we can jump in. Okay, it. if you if you feel we have time, that's that would be great. Um, uh, I'm I'm happy for this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you know, as I said, um, I'm I'm Jewish, and and my parents were very, um, you know, were very lefties, and so I never I never grew up as most. Um, middle class Jews in this country with the idea that I had to protect Israel at all costs and that what they were doing was fine and all of all of that sort of thing. And um, as um, I guess it was in 2008, um, I was part of a group called um, what was it called? Committee for an Open Discussion of Zionism. And it was mostly lawyers. Um, I was well, actually, lawyers and a couple of and a couple of academics, and um, and it was interesting because <laughs> there were a few women in the group, and the guys who were like, you know, big activists in the '60s, they were showing their true sexist colors. I mean, I'm not sexist colors, but they were. We were like invisible, and so the three of us separated from the rest of them and started an organization called Jews Say No. And um, we organized um, a demonstration at the across the street from the Israeli consulate in New York um, in 2008. At, well, it might have been 2009, but it was when the um, when the intifada that intifada began. And um, I got involved in doing sort of creative projects with them, and one of them was a fake New York Times, which was inspired by the Yes Men, because they've done a number of fake um, papers. And the idea was to write articles that um, gave the Palestinian point of view, which the New York Times wasn't doing. And um, and we actually gave, we had them, you know, we had them actually printed and we, a bunch of us gave them out at subway stations and got a lot of attention. And then a few years later, I had this idea because I was getting, I somehow got on the mailing list of an organization called Jewish, the Jewish National Fund, which was first formed in 1901, I think. Um, and it's a charitable, so-called tra charitable organization. And the New York branch put out a very glossy um, kind of news, it was a magazine really, and I somehow was on that mailing list. And so I got kind of interested in, I looked at it all the time and it was all this wonderful stuff they were doing in, in you know, the occupied territories, building forests and, you know, planting forests and, and all sorts of other stuff. Well, I started looking into this and as it turned out, they, there was somehow um, going way back, I mean, to the, um, 40s, Israel um, was able to, even though it's Ill, it would have been illegal for the state of Israel to do this, they were able to sort of subcontract with the Jewish National Fund to um, to tear down the homes of Palestinians, um, to you know kick them out of their homes, all sorts of not very good stuff. And this and uh, the um, the forest, it was called let the let the desert bloom was their motto. And they would plant forests over um, Palestinian villages that had been destroyed. And um, uh, and also they did a lot with the water system, kind of um, uh, rerouted it so that it it went through, it, it, it did not take care of Palestinians in the land and um, all sorts of, really illegal activities, but because they were not the state of Israel, somehow or other, it was okay under Israeli law. And so um, we came up with, it was actually, it was my idea really to do this. We What we did was we, um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, a liberal uh, old, old newspaper in the States called The Forward. Um, it's a Jewish, Jewish newspaper, goes back I don't know, to the early 20th century, probably. And we used their logo. I mean, we faked their logo and called it Moving Forward. And um, we collected articles about the various activities of, of the Jewish National Fund. And a lot of it had to do with the land and transforming the land. 
and put them all together like a newspaper. So the articles were from like 2005 to 2018, which is, we, we put it out on the um, 70th anniversary of the Nakba. And when the forward got wind of it, because it came out, it never was a published version, it was just online. They tried to sue us. And so we actually had to change it. I mean, there's a there's a link to it on the website, on, on your, your, your website. We changed the name to Ongoing Nakba, and then it was okay. And um, it got a lot of distribution at the time, but it's also, it's also fascinating to see um, how much this organization was involved with in, in very destructive ways. And then it was really a result of, um, you know, the march on, to Prespa with, with Yanni when he invited me to that, that I got so interested in the actual landscape of Israel-Palestine. And um, there was also um, an exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum called This Place, that I went to visit three times and I decided to review it. Um, I wrote an article about it. And what was fascinating about this exhibition is that um, it was international photographers, some very, very well-known photographers, no, no Israelis, oh well, yeah, no Israelis, no Palestinians. And it was supposedly an exhibition of Israel and the West Bank, which in a certain way it was, but it was completely apolitical. There was no context whatsoever for what you were looking at. And so there were, and there were some be very beautiful photographs. I mean, there are some, you know, a few, um, I think there's a link to that too. Um, and so again, that made me fascinated with this lack of context. And this is my growing interest in the notion of contextualizing everything. Um, and that was what my article attempt, my my review t attempted to do. It wasn't really a review of the works of art. It wasn't about the aesthetics of the individual works of art. It was more about the concept for the exhibition itself. And so, you know, I'm just very interested in that situation. Um, and it gets very little attention in this country, whereas because you know the U.S. is a big supporter of Israel and arms it and um, and it's been going on for, for you know, for <laughs> ever since the uh, found the formation of Israel, really. Um, and you know, I guess I grew up in a, in an um, atmosphere of social justice, and this is what um, being Jewish meant in my family and and many families. And now, you know, now in the United States, there are a lot of younger um, Jews who. Um, are very concerned about the injustices that are meted out to Palestine, Palestinian people. So uh, I don't know what, where this will go at all. Um, I, when I was at Wesleyan, also one professor who was, um, you know, a, an, a Zionist, he was actually an emeritus professor, so he wasn't even there anymore, but he, um, he got very upset about an exhibition I did that included a poetics, very, very poetic work um, of that had a, a what's his name, uh, Marwa, Marwan Darvish, the poet, famous Palestinian poet. Um, and there was a very beautiful kind of glittery image of part of a, a caterpillar um, tractor um, that, you know, destroyed home, they just, it's Caterpillar, which is an American company, destroys homes in Israel. And he decided that I should be fired. So he contacted the president of the university and my boss and said, you know, basically fire her. And they actually took him seriously. And I had to get professors to come to my support, come to my aid. And I even in, contacted the American Association of University Professors who defended me. And then they backed off. But um, there's, you know, there's a lot of, it's an issue that is very controversial in this country, in the United States. Um, and it's also, I mean, something that I find very disturbing about it is that this equation of anti-Semitism and being opposed to Israeli government policies. And this is used over and over again to destroy careers, and um, I don't know. I, I sometimes think it's a um, 
form of desperation on the part of the Zionists that they are just desperately hold, trying to hold on. And I mean, I don't know, um, some of you might be academics and I don't know whether you've encountered any of this in your lives, but it'd be interesting to know. So anyway, I'm very interested in this, this um, and um, and I also would recommend if any of you have, I don't know if you've heard of a Palestinian lawyer um, by the name of um, Raja Shehaza, who wrote a book called Palestinian Walks. He, his father was also a lawyer and he founded a, a, um, a God, what was it, a human rights organization in Palestine called um, Al Haq, H A Q. And he lives there and he's written a number of books about growing up there and walking the landscape and his memories of it and very, very moving and wonderful and poetic, you know. Um, so I guess that's, I mean, I'd be curious to know if any, any of you have thought about this and how you've thought about it. And I hope I'm not offending anybody. <laughs> yeah. I'm furiously nodding yes. Yeah. What? It got our leading uh, politician, Jeremy Corbyn, sacked. Yes, I know, because he was accused of being an anti-Semite. I mean, it, that's the way it's used. It's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's used to demonize people, really. There's quite a yeah, big was... thing now coming um, in academia in, in Britain about it as well. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a lot of concern with certain people who are talking about Zionism um, in their teachings and they're being um, prevented from doing that. And yeah. Speaking up for the Palestinian cause or just put balancing it. Not yeah. Alone, you know, um, and it's coming through. It's interesting because it's coming through geographers. Huh. Like who would be an example? Do you? That's fascinating, um, actually. Yeah, so so in um, Newcastle University and uh, University of York, the geographers there have been speaking about um, access to land, which is what I'm interested in from an artistic point of view. And um, they've been mentioning, you know, historically who who has access and who doesn't, and of course the the whole thing in in Israel and Palestine just comes up again and again I mean it's such a good example yeah right um, and uh, a young geographer has been mapping uh, digitally mapping um, the lack of land that's di the land that's disappearing from Palestinian ownership right. to um, yeah. uh, uh, Israeli ownership and that's that's really caused a lot of upset um, and uh, certain certain universities have been asked not to make any comments about it or not to teach it or, you know, to just basically ignore the whole lot. Um, wow. And uh, there's a there's a, a group called the Lands Landscape Research Group that's actually been asked to not not comment on the, on it at all. Wow. Yeah. Well, so, here pr professors yeah. are fired have been fired and um, it's and there's a there's a list that called I think it's called the um, something like the Canary Project or something like that that lists it, it attempts to humanize both academics and students who are active in you know Palestine solidarity projects um, and you know you can see it I mean I'm not on it but I know some people who are um, and um, it's really, it's, it's, I don't know, it's crazy. It seems crazy, but it's happening. Um, You're saying this is a kind of a McCarthyite uh, communist blacklist. It is, yeah, exactly, absolutely. And then, you know, the idea is that they won't get jobs or they won't get accepted at a university, um, you know, for graduate school or professorships. Um, and of course, because there are certain organizations like um, the ADL, the, um, what does that stand for? The Anti-Defamation League and the so-called Israel Lobby, they're 
because they give tons of money to candidates, political candidates, they're basically, um, you know, kind of shutting them up. You know, they they basically are, in a way, they have no choice but to support um, Israel in, you know, any kind of potential legislation that might call for justice. Um, so, it's also I mean, I, to, in, in Britain, it's also it's also linked to weapon sales, which is oh yeah, really, yeah. Um, nobody wants to talk about it because um, the weapons industry is um, is massive. Um, and I, I mean, I had a personal situation with um, with our degree student, uh, you know, because I'm just sort of a, a visiting artist lecturer and. Um, uh, do my PhD as well, and at, at uh, the university I'm involved with, um, BAE Systems uh, sponsored the um, uh, the degree show, uh, and, and I was basically cens censored for writing to the students um, for explaining to them what this actually meant and who BAE was. And then I so who report who reported you that got you censored? Well, I made it open. I just made an open oh, letter. Oh, oh, yeah. I was I wasn't going to oh. hide it. I was just you know, and then I and I just said, and I went to the students' union, and my response, the response from the students' union, was, "You better shut up because they employ lots of people." Wow. So yeah, there's oh, a capitalism lot of capitalism takes over our lives. What? Yeah. Yeah, there's a That's lot how of capitalism fear. takes over yeah, our lives. Exactly. Well, yes, and also a lot of fear about rocking the boat. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, because it might mean losing the monies. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, All right. Um, we are starting to lose people, but not for <laughs> a lack of uh, interest, clearly. Uh, and also, uh, I, for me, this has been a wonderful uh, hour and a half to listen to you speak, Nina. Um, well, I thank hope, you. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. I uh, hope everyone enjoyed it. Uh, oh, uh, I think Quinton at some point jumped in to ask a question and then uh, it didn't happen, or did I misunderstand this? So now is your chance, Quinton. Oh my God. I was just going to say, I did a project in Israel, Jordan, and uh, what was the other? Was it were Israel and Jordan, wasn't it? Yeah, mostly. Israel. Mostly Israel and Jordan, but also the Palestinian people, some Palestinian people were involved in it. But the hassle we had crossing borders and then getting a, a situation where the Palestinian people could be involved in the project without offending the Jordanians and the Israelis, it's unbelievable. And the to go for a walk in the wild places in Israel without being arrested is really difficult. <laughs> People just appear from nowhere with big guns. Yeah. What was your project? It's, it's, oh, sorry. Um, it was um, to look at the flight paths of births wow. and, and the Dead Sea. So it's all about the migration and how it knows no borders, but also how the watershed has been really degraded by Israel, really, and um, Jordan, and that's yeah. the effect on the ecology of the area surrounding the Dead Sea. It's quite a thing. Yeah. Because it's on a well, fly route, migration route for birds. So. Well, that's what um, the, the Jewish National Fund has, has really um, helped destroy the, eco, the natural ecosystem there. Yes, uh, and it's really, it's to do with the water. Yeah. It's unbelievable uh, what's happening. So are you an artist? Simon, oh, sorry. Are you an artist? Um, a photographer and musician. Uh -huh. And I was part of a group that went there. Um, and uh, yeah, but it was very interesting that the difference between the, the people and the state is just, it's, it's really pernicious to unpick. So that all the confusion between Zionism and being anti-Jewish, right. I can see why people are confused by it because there's a whole different set of behaviors from the state to to the people. And it's yeah. the state that's the issue really because it's quite mm -hmm. aggressive. Yes, and absolutely. Clean. Yeah. 
Simon, you have an interesting uh, final thought, perhaps? Do you want to say it out loud? <laughs> well, I, I would just, you know, devil's advocate. Um, I was thinking about how performance art is often used to um, raise awareness. And people sometimes, you know, say, oh, well, it's all very well protesting. Anyone can point to something and say that it's it's not good. Have you got any better ideas? And I, I thought, well, I mean, maybe that's the next frontier would be performance art um, or, or walking art that propose solutions, maybe. Or is that not the job of the performance artist? I don't know. Well, Nina, what do you think? Um, I think that's a great idea, actually. And, you know, it's interesting because I think that a good example of um, a group that that does that very well is are the yes men because they um they for example um when i say that i mean they, their their work is definitely performative um i wouldn't call them performative artists but they're definitely performing you know maybe maybe you could call them performing artists but this project that um babak talked about in the bhopal where the, it was just um where they got on bbc tv and they they said they were going to pay repara reparations. It was right when what co there were two companies, Dow and what was the other one that merged? Um, Dow and starts with a U. Uh, Union Carbide. Union, Union Carbide. Carbide. Yeah, and it was right after the merger that um, Dow Chemical. They, you know, Andy, one of the yes men, somehow was able to pull off being a <clears throat> being a trustee or a employee or you know some sort of officer of Dow Chemical and got on British TV and said they were going to pay all the people who had been affected by the fires and chemical stuff were going to be paid reparations and you know so that was proposing something positive and when they did their New York fake New York Times that had to do with climate change um, they were every article was about what could be, um, but you know was was wasn't. <laughs> so yes, I think that's a great idea. I really do. Um, well, that's the future. That's a good note to uh, end on, uh, perhaps. Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, so we we all have to uh, basically what what you're saying. We we should all learn to change the world, which you know is reasonably fair. Yeah. Uh, by by again, tomorrow. We're... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, tomorrow. today, man, it's uh, it's only uh, it's not even five o'clock here. <laughs> so, so we have time. Thank you again, Nina. It Thank was you. wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, and uh, I hope to see some of you uh, at our next event. We've got one on Monday, which is a, a sort of like a poetry reading. Uh, thanks again, and hope to see you soon. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina.